NerdErotic.com. Female Thor has arrived, and the big question is, was it the bait and switch that we anticipated? The answer is kind of. Thor Dumb and Dumber does focus on Thor, just not one that you'll recognize. That's where the real bait and switch is. This film is the gayest Marvel film yet, according to Natalie Portman. Is it safe to say that this is the gayest movie ever made in the MCU? Um, I love that <laughs> reading of it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it's a film made by a seven-year-old, according to Chris Hemsworth. Now, all film and television require varying degrees of suspension of disbelief. It's a lot easier with dramas. That's why you see a lot more of them. They're cheaper to make. And quite frankly, that's why I find most of them boring and vapid. If I want drama, I'll just remember something from my life. That's why I gravitate towards superhero films, fantasy, science fiction, I want to be taken away. Now, particularly with those genres, you need to multiply that suspension of disbelief by about a hundred to a thousand, and it works, like with Daredevil, or the Captain America trilogy, or Spider-Man 2, or Superman the movie, Superman 2 the Donner Cut, The Crow. You had that in the beginning phases of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, particularly prior to Disney taking over. Unfortunately, we are firmly planted in Disney Marvel's MCU phase bore. Now, a lot of people out there, including yours truly, have argued that the MCU phase bore is directionless, but I have to say, I think they've set out and done exactly what they wanted to do. Vandalize all the previous characters so they can bring in the all new, all different Marvel, and you're all gonna love them because everything's a mantle, right? Right? No. I guess the best non-spoiler description for Thor Love and Thunder would be what I put up on Twitter. The Disney Marvel content was an absolute product. Can't wait for next Disney Marvel product. So the question is, does Thor Love and Blunder push the Thor character forward while introducing us to new and interesting characters? No, it does the opposite. It deconstructs Thor, deconstructs the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the far superior one, the one that was put together by Paramount and not Disney. And of course, it introduces us to more contrived, vapid, derivative characters like female Thor and Kang Valkyrie. I guess that's a really long-winded way of saying that Thor and the MCU has become a parody of itself, and that's all thanks to one guy, Kevin Feige. When the film opens, we meet antagonist in product, Gore the God Butcher, who was obviously much better and much better looking in the comics, and we conveniently get his entire backstory and motivation in an opening prologue. That's right, the god Rapu tells Gore and the audience everything he needs to know about the Necro Sword. It can kill gods. So then Gore kills a god. And again, spoilers, that's the only one he kills on screen the entire film. I guess the real bait and switch was with the Guardians of the Galaxy who are barely in it and really only exist to send Thor on his way. So our product protagonist Thor is finding himself for the eighth or ninth time in the MCU series and he is playing a completely different character from even Ragnarok, a bigger idiot. As my good friend Mahler pointed out on Twitter just today at time of recording, Thor Love and Sunder shares continuity with this what the f happened? You've forgotten everything I taught you. But a warrior's patience. While you wait and be patient, the nine realms laugh at us. If the old ways are done, you'd stand giving speeches while Asgard falls. You are a vain, greedy, cruel boy! And you are an old man and a fool! Hello, made of rocks? <laughs> that is how you make movies. That's a good question, Mahler. Unfortunately, I don't have the time to get into the massive power shift that happened right after the co-opting of the Me Too Time's Up movement in conjunction with the election of Donald Trump, which led Hollywood to completely lose its mind, followed immediately by certain fortifications due to a certain crisis leading to a certain summer of love, which exacerbated the hysteria leading directly to turning all forms of entertainment into social engineering platforms for content and influence. Back to female Thor, boring and dumb. Now, I'm not going to break down this entire film because it was boring and dumb. 
It was pretty well cast. Unfortunately, they were wasted standing in front of a volume green screen spackled in Technicolor splooge. Within the first few minutes, they make an absolute mockery out of everything that's happened in previous Thor films, including the deaths of Frigga, Odin, Heimdall, the Warriors 3, who are referred to as that guy, and Loki's sacrifice in Infinity War. Coincidentally enough, it was Loki's TV show that also made a mockery of the MCU, everything being Kang's will, and of course, course, the Infinity Stones being paperweights not to be outdone. There's an Infinity Gauntlet ice cream shop. You know that little event where half the people in the universe disappeared for five years and returned to a Disney Marvel dystopia? And yes, I'm gonna go there. That would be like having a Holocaust ice cream shop. That's how stupid this idea is. But that's Thor stuffing things in a nutshell. And don't fret, they don't even mention the blip. The plot goes a little something like this. Gore the God Butcher wants to kill gods because of the loss of his daughter and he has the Necro Sword. Now, how did he get it? Well, he just ran across it did the sword corrupt him? Maybe not so sure. Large portions of this film, and I'm talking about a half an hour, are dedicated to just getting us back up to speed, getting Thor back in shape, reintroducing us to Jane Foster, who hasn't been in anything since Thor Dark World, and unfortunately, Jane Foster has cancer. How's she dealing with it? Well, pretty good. Of course, this film features King Valkyrie, who is as bored with ruling Asgard as we are with her character. Oh, and I almost forgot, like most of this movie, Korg, who's just there to be Taika Waititi. So they all team up with Thor to get Gore, who has kidnapped what appears to be a bunch of fatherless children from Asgard. I mean, this is a Disney Marvel product, and all male leads need to be balanced out by a minimum of two women. The gang goes to Omnipotent City, an abode of the gods, to raise an army to free the fatherless children of Asgard. Zeus, who is played like a stereotypical Greek deli owner by Russell Crowe ends up being, and this should surprise no one, a complete douchebag and turns him down. Because Zeus is such a predictable Disney Marvel male douchebag, Tang Valkyrie conveniently susses out that they don't really need an army, they just need his fake ass looking lightning bolt. After a sloppy CGI fight, Thor then kills Zeus and steals his fake ass looking lightning bolt, and they are whisked away by the screaming goats. A joke that might have been funny once, but not three or four times. Personally, I'm a against any social media platform banning anyone for dead naming but I would be for them banning people for dead memeing. Then Thor and his Disney Marvel obligatory female backup go off to fight Gore and free the fatherless Asgardian children. In the sloppy CGI fight, Korg was taken out and reduced to only a face, which I'm sure was a move that had nothing to do with effects budgets. Okay. Does that look real? In that particular shot, no, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't <laughs> really, right? When you look close. You need to be more blue. Well, well you know. No. Shut the f up! Now, there's a couple of big battles towards the end of female Thor subscribers and consumers, and Kang Valkyrie was taken out early. Coincidentally, the quote-unquote creatives took her out of this movie for the same reason the audience was glad she was taken out. Lack of interest. Now, instead of having Gore the God Butcher actually butcher gods like he does in the comic books, here, he's just seeking out an omnipotent being named Eternity and simply wish all the gods dead. Yes, you heard me right. And all he needs is a key. And that key is Thor's Stormbreaker, which can summon its own Bifrost Bridge. That probably could have come in handy once or twice during the Infinity Saga, but that's not the only thing. When Thor eventually finds the children, he imbues them with the power of Thor. Well, that would have come in pretty damn handy during, well, the entire Infinity Saga. That's right, he temporarily imbues all the children with the powers of Thor. When did he get these powers? Has he had them all along? Did he get them when Odin died? Did he get them through Zeus's fake ass lightning bolt because we did see it separate? We're never told specifically. I think the answer is he's had them for at least a while because he unintentionally imbues female Thor with his power with a passing statement. I suppose the debate can rage on in the comments section below, but ultimately, it doesn't matter. Oh no, I know it matters to actual fans who have read the comic books, but it doesn't matter to the people who create these films. And I will have a definitive answer for you at the end of the video. Yes, that's a tease to make you watch it all the way to the end. That's right, female Thor swoops in and saves the children, saves Thor, saves the day, and makes the ultimate sacrifice. But that's okay because after this character has been gone for eight years and then she came in and approached appropriated Thor's power, she was there to teach him the lesson he was meant to learn in this film. 
how to love. Which is almost, no, not almost, it's exactly like what happens at the end of Doctor Strange. Laura Palmer, I'm sorry, Christine Palmer, was missing for years. Then she shows up to teach Doctor Strange how to love. I love you. Paging Dr. F as far as the main characters are concerned, I guess I could say the best out of the worst was Christian Bale's gore, who needed a lot more time because the performance was just wildly inconsistent from tortured father to overacting villain to vengeful demon who looked like crystal meth Uncle Fester. Korg, like this film, is just an overused joke. Speaking of jokes, then there's Kang Valkyrie, a testament and a monument to the MCU, the gold standard of tokenization and identity politics, whose only purpose in this film is to be Tessa Thompson and a king because a king somehow is a higher rank than a queen according to intersectional feminism do you feel empowered women on the subject of female empowerment and female thor nothing says it more than giving women male hand-me-downs i can't think of anything that would inspire little girls to better themselves than by telling them that nothing they really do matters and they need to appropriate an established male title hmm, how did that work out for doctor who to be fair natalie portman tried to channel the jane foster she played in the first thor film but it's been a long time, over a decade. Now, she wasn't as insufferable as, say, female Loki or Captain Marvel. Doesn't mean she was good either, and it doesn't mean this wasn't MCU. She still got the big hero moment. She saved Thor and got a statue. Oh, and those are some CGI guns. You want my respect? Hit the gym, just like Chris Hemsworth did, and other actresses have done in worse movies. Jessica Biel looked great in the awful Blade Trinity, and who could forget Linda Hamilton in the brilliant Terminator 2, just to name a couple. You can't have your girl card and equality. It's one or the other. But as far as derivative and tokenized characters go, female Thor takes the cake because she literally took a dude's name and not just an established marvel character an established mythological character that's been around for thousands of years and this is a problem that would have been easily solved from the get-go give her slightly different powers and a different name now why didn't they do that was the massive multi-billion dollar corporation disney motivated by profits screwing over the original creators or their estates so they can maintain the copyright or was it agenda yes this is something that even gets brought up in the film gore calls her lady thor and she corrects him and tells him that she is the mighty thor when she's actually female thor and you would think that's the very definition of the mcu but there is a couple of more ingredients required to help build up these modern female characters in the eyes of disney marvel the complete and total degradation humiliation demoralization of the established male character and they don't really miss an opportunity to do that in thor misandry and intersectionalism thor is reduced to a bumbling idiot more in line from kevin from ghostbusters 2016 thor disney and groomers has a lot of other problems as well including the humor which everyone has talked about and they're not underselling it the product which is consistent with d plus and all the phase bore is a series of and thens topped off by humor that doesn't land, killing the verisimilitude. With a film like this, there needs to be a balance between the humor and the action. One of the best examples is from the MCU, and unfortunately, it's the film that led to a lot of this. Guardians of the Galaxy. Another thing that's not being undersold is the tonal shifts will give you whiplash. And as many have said, the sets look cheap, the special effects look colorfully bland, and this movie is just a mess. And the ending was just bad. Eternity, a character from the comics that I would have loved to have seen, was just a stationary effect. Female Thor dies, then Gore cries, then Gore dies, then Thor gets Gore's daughter. Does anyone in the MCU have sons anymore? Well, I guess Heimdall had a son, Axel, in this film. Unfortunately, he's dead and not around. What kind of message does that send? Oh, and by the way, that's why the film is called Love and Thunder. No, not Heimdall being yet another Hollywood absentee father. Thor being the father to Gore's daughter. But wasn't that Guns N' Roses music cool? Sure, but I can listen to complete songs in places like The Gym. I completely understand why a lot of women are gonna like this. You flip too hard, damn it! Yes! Yes! But it ain't gonna be for Kang, Valkyrie, and female Thor. Thor diminishing and returns isn't the worst of Marvel Phase Bore. If we were gonna do a top five of, say, the Disney Marvel MCU Phase Bore, I would say that 
Thor would top the list at being the best of the worst, followed by Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Bracelets at the second best of the worst. Black Widow would be the third best of the worst. The fourth best of the worst would be Doctor Strange Mom, and the absolute worst would be the Eternals. Overall, Thor is just another character sacrificed on Disney's altar of agenda due to not just lack of respect for the source material, outright disdain for the source material. And what proof do I have of this? Well, I teased this earlier in the video. It comes from Taika Waititi himself, who said, I will ruin your mythos in a minute, baby. Not a great plan. Nergerotic.com Female Thor.